Hi. My name is Sam Pierce. I'm the founder of a company called Jelly Products, which um, is based in Nottingham, and it's two people, me and my wife. I'm here today, literally like, like I've been introduced, because I'm living this. I'm living what you're all here to talk about. So I've come up with, a, I came up with an idea that I think's world-beating, disruptive, life-changing, hopefully for me. <laughs> and I, I've nurtured that idea from over the last six years. I've grown it, I've developed it. And I successfully launched it at a bike show in Bristol two weeks ago. Yeah. So what's the revolutionary about this little wheel? It's got suspension built in. So you can take an ordinary bike, as long as there's some clearance in the frame, fit our wheels, you've got full suspension. But not only that, it's not just a suspension element, it's got the ability to uh, take out the road noise because these springs act as dampers so you don't get high frequency noise. There's also elements where, as you're pedaling, the mismatch of the pedal can be absorbed by the springs and transferred to the wheels. So you get a really smooth ride. So these are just little things that have come along, along the way. But I really want to talk about if I had a title of my talk, it'd be, why? With a big question mark. Why give up a steady job? Why put your family at financial risk? Why try something that may not work? And why stand up and speak when you hate public speaking? <laughs> and finally, why reinvent the wheel? So we'll go back to the start. And that means going back to 2007. I, I consult for people as a day job, or used to. And I sat at an airport waiting for my flight home, not thinking about designing, thinking about my flight. And uh, I noticed a mother pushing a stroller. And when it hit the curb, the child was flung forward. And I thought, why can't we have suspension in all directions in that wheel? And I got out my sketch pad, did a little sketch. Thought, oh, that'll do it. Closed the sketch pad and went home. Did nothing with it for two years. But it, that thought just kept coming back to me. So one day I thought, I had a Sunday afternoon, I thought, right, I'm going to make a model. Got some plywood, got some C-shaped guttering from B&Q. <laughs> and I made a wheel. I used a pencil as the axle, rolled it across my finger. It worked. The physics worked. So I thought, right. I'll leave it. A few months later, I'd made a mountain bike wheel with steel. Now, you could hear me coming down the road from two miles away. <laughs> but it worked. The physics worked. That's great, but you can't base your company future on that. And my background is idea creation, pattern protection, license it to, to companies around the world. So I thought, can I protect it? with a patent. So first thing, file your patent. It's the best way to do it. File your patent, see what comes back in the search reports. And that envelope comes through the door six weeks later, and you want a wafer-thin envelope, because you know they've not found much. I got an envelope like that. <laughs> 20 patents of people who'd done it before. But interestingly, they'd done it a long time ago, 100 years ago, just after the First World War about six really good patents. At that point, normally I go, can it, leave it. Because if I can't make money from it, I can't feed my family. But I thought, why don't we see wheels like this everywhere? If it's such a good idea, what, where have they gone? What's happened? So I took every single one of those patents, I analyzed it, I made a massive spreadsheet on a piece of paper, not on a computer. And I put their ideas against my ideas. And there were lots of red crosses, which was where they had it, I didn't. But there was a whole line of ticks where I had something. So I thought, right, I'll carry on. So we go forward two years now. This is two years solid work 
I'm on my 30th wheel, 100th spring probably, and, and it's looking up. And you may say, well, I'm a bad designer, but it's not. What we're trying to do here, we're trying to create a wheel that moves in this plane, so you feel like you've got suspension. This plane, no movement. Yet, when you apply the brakes, the wheel doesn't collapse. So we've got some real tricky technical things to achieve. And you've got to avoid what's already here, frames, brakes. You've got to live with what's already there. <coughs> and every single wheel I had to test ride. So when you're designing something you're going to ride, you get it right. <laughs> and most of the time I didn't get it right. And many times I'd be, I'm lucky I've got some woods near to my house, so I drive to the woods, take the bike out, normally six in the morning or late at night because you couldn't show anyone. And a number of times it's wheels collapse, I'm five miles from the car. So I'm walking back, frame in one hand, wheel in the other going, why me? But usually by the time you get back to the car, you thought, right, I know what the problem was. I know what the next one will be. And you keep going. So move forward again. Eventually you've got, you've got something. It works. You've got some IP. Who are you going to sell it to? Who's going to buy this? So obviously first choice is the bike manufacturers. Go and see some OEMs. Do some work. Got some really good meetings set up. You take the wheel, they sign a non-disclosure agreement so they can't talk about it, great. They ride it, they love it. You think, this is it, I'm there, I'm going to do it. It's too risky for them. Too risky. So you come out of that meeting, you go, what am I going to do? They love it, they won't commit to it. I know, I'll manufacture it myself. So we're a small outfit in Nottingham, self-financing, we're saying, but all the bikes are made in the Far East. But we keep going, but why not? So I spent the next nine months taking the concept and making it mass manufacturable. So getting the cost down, best way to assemble it, how we're going to do it, how we're going to do it. So fast forward to January this year. We've got a finished design. We've got a good bomb cost, global IP, and we've actually got a, a bit of a brand coming on in a loose form. But nobody knows about us. You did a Google search on loop wheels. This time last year, two weeks ago, it would have come up with a Japanese clothing company. Nothing. And we did that on purpose because at Bespoke, I wanted to have a line in the sand where we said, before this date, this didn't exist. After this date, it's here and it's ours. Because there's two of us, but if we can frighten people off with its brand, it gives us some extra protection in the future. <coughs> but how do you access these people instantly? You have to target the two or three journalists who are going to blog it. So at Bespoke, we knew the two people we needed to get on our bike. And we got those two people on the bike. They weren't allowed to ride at the show, I made sure. They both rode around the show. They loved it. A few people tried to break it. They didn't. But by the Sunday night, they'd all both written articles, and it was starting to go viral. So now if you go on Google and put in loot wheels, you get to the ninth page before you go back to Japanese clothing. <coughs> And that's done on a budget of £300. But you've got to have the right story. <laughs> so, yeah, just, I'm going to finish. I'm not going to do 20 minutes, because I'm nearly out. But just going to finish with two questions that send a shiver down my spine. They're not why questions. The first one is, what's your exit strategy? And the second one is, when are you going to sell out? And I'm saying, I've only just started. Thank you.